I have not been this excited about an episode ever since we started the barber shop. Uh, we have today with us uh, Viren Raskina. He is the CEO of Olympic Gold Quest. Uh, he was the captain of the Indian hockey team, an Olympian, and someone who is really, really building out sport. Viren, um, welcome to the barber shop. Uh, we also have Rahul, who is now a barber shop expert. I wanted to leave when I still felt that I was playing good hockey. Many thought I was equally mad. Well, after ISB, um, I ditched a conventional corporate job. You could hear her coach scream. Like I think Uthale Mira, that voice reverberated inside that entire stadium. And the moment she had held it and she had successfully done it, you could see the smile and the tears flowing down her yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. She dropped it and and you could just. Look at how many women athletes have made it big, right? Saina, Sindhu, Mary, Sakshi was there as well. Lovelina. How many states, communities, regions these people are coming from? In how many sports we are doing really well? We do not support the para athletes based on their disabilities. We support them on their abilities. Hi, uh, welcome to the barber shop. And today I have one of the most excited. I mean, I have not been this excited about an episode ever since we started the barber shop. Uh, we have today with us. Uh, Viren Raskina, uh, he is the CEO of Olympic Gold Quest. Um, the tagline of, of Olympic Gold Quest is it takes six grams of gold to lift the worth of a nation. I'm privileged to have kind of been associated with uh, with with the UGQ um, uh, for the last couple of years. But uh, Viren Raskina is an institution in himself. Uh, he was the captain of the Indian hockey team, an Olympian, and someone who was really really building out sports. Uh, in India, in a very, very uh, fascinating and deeply scientific way. Uh, Viren, uh, welcome to the barbershop. Uh, we also have Rahul, who is now a barbershop expert. But I must thank Rahul for uh, for introducing Viren and me uh, two years back. And your association with OGQ goes back uh, almost 15 years. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, taking the time and being here. Uh, but Viren, welcome to the barbershop. You, you, you have seen some episodes yourself. Thanks, Shantanu. Uh, super excited to be, uh, to be here. Uh, and uh, I think Bombay Shaving Company is doing some um, uh, amazing work. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, no, right from the first episode where uh, where Ashish Mohapatra was there. And, and actually, uh, it, it, it was great to see that because uh, Ashish was a mentor of mine when when I was at ISB and I was doing McKinsey interviews. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I always knew Ashish would do great things. <laughs> uh, you know, I loved uh, uh, Mukesh Mansal's episode as well. Mukesh is, uh, is one of our board members oh, yeah. on OGQ and a very, and uh, as we all know, is extremely passionate about sport and fitness. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, these were some of the episodes. And yeah, Raul and me go back a long way. Raul was the first research head at OGQ and... Uh, uh, I think he taught me a lot. He put laid down a lot of processes at OGQ, which, especially on research, which have been followed till today. So uh, yeah, it's it's great that Raul could find time to be here as well. No, amazing. Uh, when uh, by the way, for the Mukesh episode, I was wearing an OGQ T-shirt. I, I I I saw that. I saw that. I was just thinking to myself, I wanted to text you saying you're wearing the right T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I I not planning knowing that he was on the board. So I not like I knew it, but it's not why I wore the T-shirt. I just wore it because. Uh, you know, I felt like wearing it that day. Right, uh, right. And that's the first thing. Wearing a good T-shirt today as well. Yeah, this, this, this <laughs> is my first OGQ T-shirt. <laughs> so I now have like a collection of five or six. You've been kind enough to send it to me. Uh, but no, the, the he saw me and he said OGQ. Yeah. What do you do with OGQ? And I said, no, no, I mean, I got introduced to him in a couple. I mean, like no, he was. He said uh, he's been so happy to be a part of it. But working with athletes uh, across the entire life cycle from identification as as very young. To kind of nurturing them mentally, physically, training, to taking them uh, to you know all around the world to with world class coaches, and then into competitions, into the Olympics, and then winning medals and seeing the anthem being played. You've seen it all, Viren. Um, and actually, you know, Rahul and I were trying to prepare for this conversation as 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 deeply as we could. We uh, you know we really wanted to make sure that we capture the essence of 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 what you do. And we wanted to start off by, uh, by 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 just talking about excellence in at in athletics um, or in sports in general. Uh, a lot of people feel that there are like there are two approaches, and Rahul give me the example through this you know to the Tiger Woods versus Roger Federer, uh, you know uh, comparison. The Tiger Woods was like was a golfer at the age of three, right, and was swinging five hours a day from the age of three. 
and and there are five was winning tournaments where, where the kids were 14 15 years old and it, it 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 just felt that he was born to play golf very much like sachin and messi in their sports uh while federer for example was someone whose parents and he like i played many sports uh growing up you were someone who kind of played many sports growing up you played football uh, obviously hockey was your first love uh is there a right approach to achieving excellence in athletics what's 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 your view on that oh i think a very interesting question and uh, you know both science has also con- continuously evolved and i would say that there's no right or wrong approach to this uh i would say modern sports science says that it's best to play different sports and actually expose young kids to playing different sports uh football hockey i think it's it's best if you balance out teams at least one team sport and maybe a few individual sports and by the time you are on 14 or 15 maybe that's the right time to start getting specialized and to think about specialized training and coaching uh but there's one thing that's a certain and and by the way what what, what happens with different sports is that you d- develop different skill sets uh, uh so take for example a player who fit for a football match so you play 90 minutes you run up and down uh, on uh, on lengthy f- on a lengthy field might not be fit to play singles badminton on uh, which may be a match will last anywhere between say 40 minutes to 1 or 20 minutes or may not be fit to play a boxing bout which is 3 rounds of 9 minutes so but you can't say that a footballer is not fit Yeah. or a badminton player might not be able to do what a footballer does where you're uh, 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 running long strides up and down continuously on the pitch uh, and and so on and so forth but you can't say that uh, someone is unfit it's just that there are different fitness specific for different sports uh, the kind of agility the kind of strength uh, that you require so every sport has its unique skill sets and every skill set that you learn will eventually help you in the one sport that you choose in the end uh, and I just feel that one important the most important thing here is to just have good coaches and if you have the right coach I was really blessed because when I was 10 years old in my school so it was St Sanishwas High School in Bandra it's a school that has a history and tradition of and culture of playing hockey and football and there were about I think I don't know the exact number but maybe about five or six players who went on to play for India including a few olympians and one of them was marcelis boom wow. he represented india at the 1984 los angeles olympics and he was my school coach so it was one of the old jesuit schools we were lucky to have big playgrounds uh, a hockey field today schools don't even uh, you know just modern buildings with no no playground as well but my school had big playgrounds so i was lucky in that respect we had a culture of hockey so again there there was lucky but the most important thing was i had a very good coach from the age of 10 so i think he taught me technical skills uh or of hockey so everything i learned from hockey i think i learned from marcelus gomes when i was 10 years old um but i think just more than technical skills he taught me about team work about uh, uh about just work ethic about never giving up communication skills resilience so many things i think he taught me life skills but the problem is 0.0001% of kids may be having good coaches yeah. and 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 that's the hard part in india so there's no right or wrong but if we have to if india has to produce really good players across sport i think the coach is the most important uh, factor at what point did you realize varian that hockey would be your full time would be something you want to pursue full time was it were you in school at that time was masters gomes one of the one of the people who kind of said hey this might be worth doing full time like what point did you realize well you you love football right yeah. uh you know you probably more watch more football than hockey maybe on an average week right uh, just dog choice of club but at least the sport is right <laughs> uh, and for the animation and this is two manchester united guys talking to liverpool <laughs> but, but uh you played football i think at a reasonable level right before you so you were more federary than you know tiger woods oh absolutely i i played all sports honestly where you name you name it i played it so football hockey cricket i think gilli danda <laughs> uh, you know i i i played it all and uh the funny thing was i think i was better in football than i was in hockey i actually 
represented Mumbai at the under 13 level before I represented Mumbai in hockey. Wow. So, uh, uh, so football was definitely my first love. Actually, it still is till, uh, till today. And uh, I, I prefer to play uh, uh, football today. I, I don't play any hockey at, uh, <laughs> at all, mainly because I'm not fit enough. <laughs> uh, but that's a separate story altogether. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, uh, sorry, Shant. When did you realize that, yeah, you know? When did I uh, realize? You know, actually, I never realized it all throughout my... Young, I, I didn't even seriously contemplate playing hockey at the highest level because, you know, I come from a very traditionally conservative middle class background where studies were important. Uh, a mum was a doctor, my eldest brother was an engineer. So you know, back in the growing up in the 80s, 90s, you had to become a doctor or an engineer to uh, be regarded as a success. And uh, although my parents didn't put any pressure uh, as well, society generally, social norms were such that you had to become a doctor or engineer. My uh, parents were super strict, I remember, when my eldest brother and he eventually became an engineer. They were medium strict with my second brother. He was really good at football as uh, well, much better than me. He played at a fairly high level and eventually he became an engineer as well. And I was the third and lucky one because by the time I came along, my parents were not bothered at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> So that's how I could play hockey actually. But you know, I didn't contemplate playing hockey seriously. Just one thing led to the other. And I remember I think the turning point for me was when I captained the Mumbai under 21, uh, the Mumbai junior hockey team in the, in the junior national championship. That was in 1998 in, in Bangalore. And the Mumbai team came to the final of the junior national championship after 25 years. Wow. And uh, uh, from there, I immediately called, was called to the Indian junior team at, at that time. And yeah, and, and that was the first time I really thought, oh, I, I could actually play at this level. And uh, even before that, I honestly never even contemplated uh, playing hockey really seriously. And what was that transition like to go from, and I'm assuming you would have been in college when you were 20, 20 yes, right? Yes, I, I was 18 or 19 at that time. Correct, just entering college or maybe yes, I, yes. in fact, end of uh, high school. But... What was it like to kind of finish college or go through college now knowing that you're going to be a professional athlete? Yeah. Uh, obviously, I think it comes with a lot of pride. Parents up. I mean, you underplayed a lot, but I'm sure being called up for India is something that happens, doesn't happen in every household, right? So, yeah. what, was there now a step change in motivation, clarity in terms of, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the next 5, 8, 10, 15 years and uh, is to play for India and try and get better and better in terms of your skill set, the kind of coaches you've got access to, the kind of players you're now playing with? Yeah, I think it was a step up for me in terms of just the challenges and intensity because, uh, you know, for me, until that time, I actually, actually never trained day in, day out, five, six hours a day. And at that time, when I was 18 years old, I was in, I think, what, first year BCom at that time and then I was called to the junior India camp until then I trained one or two hours a day uh, and I think I had God given natural talent for hockey but it, 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 it at that point of time because for me studies were equally important uh, so I, I didn't really play hockey or train really seriously and when I got called to the India camp that was like six seven hours a day of serious training and I remember the first month was the hardest month. Like the, It just was such a shock to my body to take that level of training load that I felt like I wanted to go home a million times <laughs> in, in, in that first one month. And uh, yeah, so, so that was hard to deal with that transition and, 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 and deal with that. And uh, yeah, but eventually uh, it became something that I really loved doing. And of course, I see I... I honestly eat, breathe and live sport. So I love sport. It was such a pride for me. It was huge pride for my parents, especially my dad. My dad uh, loves sport. He watches everything, every sport. So for his son to be playing in the Indian team, I think it meant the world to them. And uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just something I love doing. And and today now, post my, post my career, you know, growing up, none of us could think that we could work in sport. 
but for me to get the opportunity to work in sport every single day to work with the best players in the country some of them the best in the world is just an honor and privilege and i actually don't feel like i'm doing any work every day because i just love what i'm doing in a way i think one of the one, like every time we we talk uh, about ogq i think or you you're presenting ogq to an external uh, person for the first time i think your story at the olympics uh, is one that all when rahul keeps telling me this that i must we must have heard the story a bit 20 times 30 times but every time it's it's always goosebumps but talk about talk about you know about one is being in the indian team uh but then there is the element of captaincy and then there is representation at at the olympics yeah but yeah. T- talk 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 about that experience a little bit yeah uh, you know again uh, in a sport like hockey uh playing at the olympics is the ultimate dream and i remember as a 16 year old kid 1996 uh, uh young teenage me watching back at home leander pace won the olympic bronze medal yeah. in 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 hockey and i remember uh, watching at home on tv uh i saw leander standing on the podium uh, tear rolling down his cheeks indian flag going up and for me that was my moment of inspiration how old were you i was 16 years old 96 wow. uh, atlanta and um, yeah you know i wanted to likely end the play for india i wanted to captain the indian hockey team i wanted to play at the olympics i wanted to win an olympic medal for india and i was very lucky that the first three dreams got fulfilled but the final one of winning an olympic medal myself as a player that remained unfulfilled um, i played at athens 2004 and in uh, that tournament i remember india was playing australia in a very crucial league match we had to win that match to have a chance of going to the uh, to have a good chance of going to the semi final australia for them a draw was enough at that point of time uh india was leading 1-0 in the first half australia equalized in one hole at half time that time uh, hockey was two halves of 35 minutes yeah. uh, now it's four quarters of yeah. 15 minutes in the second half i remember dandraj pillai got a yellow card and he was sent off for around 10 minutes now it's hard playing against australia 11 versus 11 she's <laughs> like bordering on the impossible <laughs> hanging uh, uh, with them 10 versus 11 for 10 minutes yeah and in that 10 minute period australia scored two goals they were leading 3-1 dandraj came back on the pitch india made it 3-2 with about 7 minutes left on the clock india made it 3 all and we were throwing the kitchen sink at Australia, attacking like crazy, putting pressure on them. But their goalkeeper had a spectacular night. He saved everything we threw at them. Uh, I remember around four minutes left on the clock, India hit the Australian goalpost. The ball hit the goalpost and came back into play. With 52 seconds left on the clock, India had a free hit on top of the Australian D area. Except our goalkeeper, uh, Adrian was in the goal. Uh, all 10 of us went on top. Yeah, it's not like football where even the goalkeeper can go. <laughs> uh, and in that last minute, what happened happened in a blur because in our urgency to try and score and find the winning goal, one of us made a mistake. The Australians intercepted the ball in their D area. They counterattacked us, and with 20 seconds left on the clock, Australia scored the winning goal that night. Uh, Australia won that match 4-3. That match finished around 10 p.m. Athens time. I remember crying on the sidelines till around 12 midnight because for me it was around six, seven years of effort that had gone into preparing for the Olympics. And uh, uh, yeah, I remember being very angry and frustrated, not because one of us made a mistake, not because India lost. I was just angry and frustrated, and the system, which I feel at that point of time did not gear us well enough to handle the pressure against the best teams in the world. And that Australian men's hockey team went on to win the gold medal at Athens 2004 for the first time ever in their history and only time ever in their history in men's hockey. And the reason I tell the story is because at the highest level of world sport, the difference between winning gold or just participating can literally be the width of a goalpost or 20 seconds left on the clock. The margins between the best teams in the world are very fine. 
and it's about bringing a hundred factors together that go into building champion teams and and champion athletes. And now that's what we try to do at OGQ, and just try to, from my own experiences, try to improve the process in the small one percenters. Because if we get one percent better in coaching, one percent better in infrastructure, in equipment, in recovery, in nutrition, in physical fitness, in endurance, that's cumulatively seven or eight percent better. And sometimes that's the difference between winning gold or just participating. Does the heartbreak still stay with you? Oh, of of course. You know that never goes away. And but but I think I've sort of used it positively as a driving force. Um, and one of the reasons why I ditched a corporate job after ISB to join a not profit that uh, non for profit that that was just an idea on paper. Uh, we barely had, we had no money, no funds, nothing. Uh, uh, at that point of time, uh, uh, my salary could barely be paid. But one of the reasons that I was driven to do it because I wanted to prove that Indian athletes could do it, and Indian sport. We we had the raw material, but we had to just put the right processes and get the right people in 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 place. So uh, yeah, of course the heartbreak is there. I think for me. There's nothing like the emotion I felt in playing for the country, and the emotion of winning or the emotion of losing. Uh, nothing can replace that. But the next best thing is to look after the training of India's best athletes. So I feel equally emotional. Uh, I remember when when Sindhu won her uh, uh, her Olympic medal at Rio, when OJK was looking after Sindhu since she was 13 years old, or Lakshya Sen wins or loses today. Th- that emotion is still there. Uh, as a player, when you have played an integral uh, part of that, I remember you sent a video from your mobile. You're standing a few feet from Sindhu, and mm-hmm. the the flag is going up, right when she's standing on the podium. Uh, yeah. It just felt like uh, truly the pride is all ours. But I'm sure you feel it like even more when you see something like that happen. Yeah, of course, uh, because you know we uh, so OJQ started supporting Sindhu when she was about 13 years old. Yeah, um, uh, 14 years old, I think. And our, our research team, uh, Raul, just after you just left. Just after I left, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Weber's uh, uh, Tendin was the head of research at that uh, time, and he had spotted this young 13-year-old girl making waves in the domestic circuit, beating girls who were three years older to her. And now that almost never happens in a physical sport like badminton because at that point of time, every six months makes a huge difference to your physical and, and uh, physical maturity, mental maturity. Um, we researched and observed Sindhu for around eight, eight months or so and finally started supporting at the age of 14. And I remember going to Hyderabad. Uh, met Sindhu's parents, Gopi Chand. At that point of time, she was uh, training at the Gopi Chand Academy, and uh, uh, and I asked them if there was one thing that OGQ could do at that point of time for Sindhu, what would it be? And Gopi and uh, Sindhu's parents unanimously said inter- uh, uh, international exposure for training right. competition. Because you have to remember, this is a 14-year-old Sindhu. No one knew her name. Yet, she wasn't in the Indian team, she wasn't getting too many international tournaments. And um, now, OGQ ourselves was a new organization, we didn't have much funds. But what we had was a lot of belief in Sindhu's ability. We somehow managed to put together the funds to send her for five international tournaments abroad. And that's the time at the age of 15, Sindhu won her first international tournament, the Maldives International yeah. Challenge. Now, Chotusa tournament, but it was very big in terms of the beliefs it gave a young 15-year-old girl that she belonged there. Uh, so, I would say big milestone in her journey. At the age of 17, Sindhu started playing Super Series tournaments, the highest level of uh, international women's badminton tournaments at that point of time. I, I remember that first year, of Sindhu played around 12 tournaments and several tournaments she lost in the first or second round. Mostly in the first round. And that year, uh, it was so hard for Sindhu to contemplate going forward. She, I, I, I would say, maybe it, it was the toughest phase of her life. I've seen her throw a racket on the floor and just saying, this feeling that, you know, I don't belong here. 
And again, I've gone through that as an athlete where sometimes you're putting in all the effort, but nothing is is working out. And again, from my own experience, I think that was the most important time to stand by a very uh, talented athlete for whom nothing was going right. She hung in there and we gave, I remember we gave her a very good sports psychologist to work with. She had a very strong team supporting her. Gopi played a huge role, obviously. Her, her parents really stood by her. And thankfully, Sindhu came out of that rut. Not many people know that exactly nine months before the uh, before the Rio Olympics, actually Sindhu got a, uh, a, a stress fracture on her foot. Yeah. And, you know, we showed her to all the orthopedic surgeons, did all the scans and uh, the doctor said it'll take around about four months for Sindhu to get back to competitive action. And that was a big blow because on the date the injury happened, her world ranking was number nine. Because she was not going to play for around four months, her ranking was going to tumble. If she dropped out of the top 60, she would have not qualified for the Rio Olympics. That day itself, we had a meeting, we put together a, a day-to-day plan of Sindhu's rehabilitation, her recovery, her strengthening, return to jogging, return to training, return to co- uh, uh, back to competing on court. And I think exactly three months, ten days from the date of the injury, Sindhu played her first competitive match again. Now that was world-class recovery by any standards. And eventually when Sindhu went to Rio, she was in the best shape of her life. I think not just physically, but more importantly, mentally. Uh, she she faced three opponents who were higher ranked than her. All three opponents had better head-to-head records than her. And she beat all of them. And at the end of it, I was uh, I, I was lucky enough to be at Rio. And when she finally stood on the Olympic podium with the silver medal, asked her, Sindhu, what happened? How come you played so well. And she told me something that meant so much to me. Uh, she told me, you know, within the last seven years that you all have been supporting me, we started supporting her at the age of 14. She won the Olympic silver medal at the age of 21. And there were so many ups and downs in that journey. So many times where you want to give up. And she said, you know, within the last seven years, the quality of support from OGQ has been so world class that every time I went on court in Rio, I just believed that I could beat anyone. And for me, that meant so much because I think that night in Athens, when we lost to Australia, I think when the Indian men's hockey team, when we walked out of the dugout and stood toe-to-toe with Australia, I don't think deep down we believed that we could beat Australia. I think in the early 2000s, our mindset was that we were happy to participate. We did not believe deep down that we could win. And so for a young 21-year-old Indian girl to say that meant everything to me. And Chantanu, I think that's the biggest change that has happened in Indian sport. Uh, Raul, you have seen for a long time as well. That just now the mindset and the belief of young Indian kids coming from uh, small towns or villages where 95% of Olympic athletes are coming from, not from the metros, they're coming from small towns and villages. But these kids now have role models in front of them. They truly believe that they can achieve and beat the best players in the world. It is such a such a huge change. I can't. I've never played at you know any reasonable level. But watching, let's say cricket in the nineties, I think that good players. But my mindset of somebody, an ardent fan watching India play, was just baffling. Like I'd be the most scared when Sachin was at the crease. Yeah. <laughs> like I just didn't enjoy the game. I, I know everyone in my generation relates to this. Yeah, like, absolutely. Because the default is, I think country came from a scarcity kind of mindset. We didn't have the abundance mindset. We're like, abhi out ho jayega. Or ek baar out ho gaya na, kuch nahi bachega. Because we have seen 65 for one to 120 for eight, and then losing by default in a World Cup of semi-final. Right? We've seen that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just constant. We, I don't think I enjoyed any game. I remember. We couldn't get over the line against Zimbabwe. Yeah. The mindset was if Sachin got out, India will be right? Yeah, and I remember feeling happy when Sachin would take a single and go to the go to the right. Can, <laughs> yeah, out nahi can you <laughs> out nahi Can you imagine? And this just changed. And I was talking to you know my son, um, and you know we were we were close to the target, and it's like, okay, now from here on, this should be safe. We should be able to get there with 
He's like, what do you mean safe? We should finish this game in two overs. <laughs> yeah. We are on top. Yeah. Why would we take our, you know, foot off the gas? The gas. Why yeah. aren't we going for the jungler? I'm no. like, man, 30 years changed so much for us. When I saw Sindhu playing, and we, uh, you know, uh, we streamed this in Trimo, and everybody was watching. Yeah. She was playing Marine. I didn't for a single second feel that she doesn't belong there. I didn't fear. It was me. I don't know badminton. I don't know sport as well, right? I didn't fear that Sindhu is not up there in terms of physical fitness, in terms of skills, but mostly in terms of how she's taking this game. Like until she lost, she lost in the three uh, uh, set match, right? And I just felt like she was up there. I feel the same way about Lakshya today. I feel the same way when Vinesh or Ravi walk onto the mat. Yeah. I feel the same way when Nikhat and, you know, all other boxers, um, you know, take uh, center stage in the boxing ring. It's so amazing. It's done so much for us as people. Yeah. Uh, you know, watching these sports persons, uh, I think it's an incredibly different new India. I, I think that's the best part about sport because I just feel that sport has the ability to inspire so much. And in a way, this belief reflects the belief of Indian society and uh, 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 both of y'all, like uh, startup founders like y'all, because it just takes so much courage to go out on your own and to ditch conventional jobs and to actually be entrepreneurs. Uh, but I think just now, uh, people have asked so much, uh, or rather they have so much less fear than say our parents did. Yeah. And uh, that's that's huge. And I think we have to give a lot of credit to even someone like a signer who was the first one. You know, in 2004, when I played at Athens, India had two singles players uh, as, in badminton at the Olympics. Uh, Nikhil Kanetkar in men's sing uh, badminton. I think Nikhil lost in the first round. And there was Aparna, 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 Aparna. In, in women's badminton, if I'm not mistaken, if memory serves me right, I think Aparna lost in the second round. And no one was surprised as such in the country because that was our level. No one would have dreamt that eight years later, Saina would have won the India's first Olympic yeah. medal. And by the way, that time, number one, two, three in the world were all Chinese. Chinese yeah. So it was literally China versus China yeah. <laughs> at, 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 at that point of time. So uh, the, uh, the the Chinese dominance in badminton was so, uh, was so much, no one believed that India could break the dominance. And China showed the way Sindhu followed. And there will be many more who, uh, in, in the future as one. So I think it's that breaking the glass ceiling sometimes is so important. And same way with the Indian women's hockey team, uh, Shantanu. Yeah. We, the Indian men won a medal at Tokyo after 41 years. But for me, the biggest story at the Tokyo Olympics was actually the Indian women's hockey team. This, uh, at Rio 2016, the Indian women's hockey team finished last. Uh, but we have to see that they qualified for Rio after 36 years. Ah. So they never played at that stage, they never played at that level. We lost virtually every game. I think we drew one game with Japan at the start. But every other team, especially the European teams, Australia, we lost by four or five goals. 90% of that same team played at Tokyo. They finished fourth. They just missed out on the Olympic medal. They beat Australia in the quarterfinal, who were unbeaten in the tournament so far. Incredible. Number one in the other. Amazing. And I was doing the live commentary on that match and when I saw those Indian women's hockey players celebrating that quarter-final win know. against Australia and about maybe about 10, uh, all those girls came from small towns, small, small villages and they were celebrating I just thought many of them from villages in Haryana, really remote places. And to see those girls celebrating that win against Australia, I just thought that maybe a million young girls are watching back home what it would do to give them hope and, and, and belief. Because that is something that's intangible. Many of those girls come from villages where girls are still getting married at 17, 18 years old. They were, they're not allowed to wear jeans, they're not allowed to have a mobile phone, they're not allowed to marry someone of their choice. And w what courage it would give uh, and hope it would give to young girls watching back home that you can actually do whatever you want in life. And I think sport in a way has that power. Yeah. No. What women athletes are doing and will do, I think, I sense far surprise 
you know, the male counterparts over the next, uh, already it's happened, right? If you look at in the last three editions, for 15 medals, yeah. we've been, you know, at OGQ, we've been fortunate to support nine uh, yeah. of these. But look at how many women athletes have made it big, right? Saina, Sindhu. Um, Mary. Not, sorry, Mary's. We haven't supported, Sa but Sakshi was there as well. It's just incredible across the board. Lovelina, how many, how many states, communities, regions these people are coming from and how many sports we are doing really well. Uh, it's just fantastic. I think I'm really bullish on this this piece. Well, I think uh, this women's sport is so important and I think given a level playing field or level playing ground, I think women will far outshine uh, the boys in, in, in Olympic sport. And mainly in, terms of, in terms of medals? In terms of uh, medals. Just, just, just think about who are the top Olympic stars in the country at the moment. Names that come to mind will be Saina, Sindhu, Merikom, Mirabai Chanu, Lovelina, Nikhat, Vinesh Fogart, previously Deepa Karmakar, etc. So, most of the stars are actually female athletes. And I've just seen the, the quality of resilience. I think just women take so much shit in our society today that they can actually handle pressure and stress much more than the guys and ability to handle pressure is one of the most important qualities of a top athlete. Yeah, because the differences are so marginal, it just comes down to mindset. I actually wanted to probe a little bit on this in terms of, we always celebrate that 1% edge in victory, right? Because it's easy to kind of, it's easy to celebrate. But when you see character and mindset of being fearless in defeat or in moments that are do you see that with younger athletes especially when they're 12, 13, 14, 15 like do you, do you see that a lot more now as opposed to maybe in the initial parts of OGK? Oh definitely because uh, see first of all I think that you learn much more from defeat than from victory because like you said at the highest level the margins are the one percenters and if it's one all 30 seconds left on the clock and if you score the winning goal you're only celebrating and having five beers <laughs> but if you lose from that position you know everyone does post-mortem everyone does uh, analysis and everyone tries to uh, do the blame game and who made the mistakes but uh, so, so so I think defeat in a way teaches you much more but I agree with you I think younger kids these days are far more fearless in taking risks uh, just look at cricket. I think the way the game has evolved, say o o o ODIs, right? When we were growing up, I remember India, Pakistan, Bangalore match. Uh, I think it was a World Cup when uh, Jadeja. Jadeja, 22 runs of Bakar Minasso. And we made some 280. Yeah. That was considered a massive score. <laughs> yeah. Today, 280 will be made by the team batting second in a canter. It, yeah. it, it, it's regarded as a small score. Yeah. Because T20s has just changed how the game is played. What is I as a player? What is considered as a big score? What do you uh, right uh, at that time? If uh, the opponent scored two eighty, yeah. you are thinking that you are in big trouble. Yeah, and so mindset and has changed. Sports evolve, and the most important factor in Indian sport, especially for coaches, is to keep pace with the latest training methods, training technology, and teach that to young kids. And then they will not be fe uh, uh, have fear in them. So if we're able to take out that element of fear, I'm seeing that happening in cricket in a big way. Yeah. We need to do that for all sports at scale. Amazing. No, but um, to the uh, there are two areas I actually wanted to cover. One was why you believe that women have a higher chance at medals. Like there is there something fundamentally different about women athletes in terms of excellence or training or you know the kind of sport choices that India will do well at maybe for the near to short short to medium term future it's like what what is it really about women athletes that in general there is a feeling that the higher you know there's a higher chance there second thing is how and we, we you know we see this with Mary Com or with Sindhu or with with Pirabai Chanu that moment you know moment there is success and it's a lot of effort till that success suddenly in their communities uh, there is an upliftment of sporting awareness and then you have like hundreds of women uh, and men also 
it's kind of seeing that this is real and it can actually happen. So I wanted to touch upon these two two things. That se- they're separate, but through an example, if you want to cover one. Yeah. Uh, no, undoubtedly, I feel like I mentioned before, if we are able to give young female athletes a level playing field and the right opportunities at the right time, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that female athletes can far outshine the boys. And uh, I think uh, two of the best examples are MC Mary Kong and uh, Mirabai Chanu, both coming from uh, uh, remote places in the Northeast uh, growing up. And growing up, they had, I would say, absolutely nowhere close to the ideal training conditions. Mary had no coach. Or, uh, she barely had boxing gloves. She didn't. She barely had shoes to run. And and that young girl went on to become uh, uh, an Olympic bronze medalist, eight world championship medals, including six gold medals in a sport where you're taking punches on your face and your body every single day. So imagine if she had the right f- uh, facilities uh, growing up. Uh, uh, and I remember in 2009, uh, Mary was in the first five athletes supported by OGQ and uh, at that time Mary used to tell me that no parent in the country wanted their daughters to take up boxing. Today every young girl in the Northeast dreams of becoming the next Mary Kong and the boxing academies especially in the Northeast, Manipur, Haryana are filled with young girls who dream of becoming the next Mary Kong. The boxing academies are not enough to intake all these young girls. We don't have enough coaches uh, to train all these talented young girls. So it's, it's an achievement of a legend like Mary Kong inspiring literally a million young girls uh, to become the next Mary Kong. Uh, look at Mirabai Chanu. Uh, again, coming from a, a small village far away from Imphal, uh, uh, came from a really poor background, barely had to, uh, uh, two square meals a day to eat. Tough girl became went on to become a weightlifter. At the Rio 2016 Olympics, Mirabai Chanu failed in all her three lifts. Now, uh, weightlifting is a really hard sport. Mira is a 49 kg weightlifter. She's a tiny girl, 4 feet 11 inches tall. In that weight category at the Olympics, you got to lift about 115 kilos in clean and jerk to be competing uh, for the, uh, 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 for an Olympic medal. Uh, to give you context, that weight is so heavy, the bar is so heavy, I am 80 plus kilos, I am fairly half decent fit. I cannot lift that bar 2 centimeters off the ground. Because if you, if I go to lift more than that, I, I know that I'm going to get a back injury for the rest of my life. Uh, in 2016, Mira was not expected to win an Olympic medal at Rio, but she was expected to be top eight, top ten in the world. So our uh, OGK are not yet started supporting weightlifting. We were not supporting Mira by Chanu, but our research team was tracking her very closely. So we were, we were very surprised when Mira did not make a single clean lift. Uh, so in December 2016, I made the journey to Patiala, her training base. And I had a long meeting with Mira and her coach yeah. just to try and understand and figure out what were the reasons that Mira did not make a, a single successful lift at Rio. And, uh, you know, in that... About three hour meeting, Meera was uh, pouring her heart out at, at that point of time and she she just said that the mental pressure on her was so intense that in, in her mind she just totally blanked out and when she went on stage she forgot the process and weightlifting is a process when you're lifting 115 kilos a 49 kg girl is trying to lift 115 kilos if you if you forget the one element of the process, you will not make a successful lift. And she equated it to someone preparing for a very public speech for five years. And when you go on stage finally in front of a million people, you forget all your lines. And that's what happened to Mirabai Chanu. Uh, from that uh, long dinner meeting we had with Mira and her coach, 
uh, we sort of uh, figured out that obviously Neera was very talented, her coach was very talented, uh, uh, but there were many gaps in the in the ecosystem. We tried and ensure that she had a very good physio working with her. Uh, no, number one, we uh, we tried to ensure that she had a very good sports psychologist working with her yeah. to help Meera overcome that fear of failure that kept plaguing her every time she went on stage. Uh, that, because the mental game is just so important in sport. Secondly, we had to ensure she had a very good nutritionist because we had to keep her weight within 49 kilos yet have the explosive strength to lift 115 kilos. Uh, and third, uh, 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 last but definitely not the least, a very good physio because, see, I'm a hockey player, I've seen a lot of injuries. We look after the training of boxers, wrestlers. So I've seen a lot of injuries in, in my lifetime, but I've not seen the kind of injuries that happen to weightlifters. Uh, the, the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics was a very tough period for athletes from all sports. Because if you remember, that was the pandemic time. Playgrounds were shut, gyms were shut. There were a lot of breaks in Mira's training. And the worst enemy of an elite athlete is breaks and stoppages in training. And it, it just results in many more injuries. So in the last three months in the lead up to Tokyo, Mira, I think, had about four injuries at four different stages. She had a back injury, neck injury, shoulder injury, and a thigh injury. And each time we thought, Oh gosh, that's over. That's it. Uh, five years of effort gone down the drain. But I think just champions are made of a different element altogether. And that young lady just kept fighting, 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 pushing the pain barriers. And finally, 24 July 2021, first day of competition of the Tokyo Olympics. Mirabai Chanu finally successfully lifted 115 kilos in clean and jerk and won the Olympic silver medal. And, you know, all of us, including me, we cried buckets in the back end, buckets of tears. Uh, because for us, it was four or five years of effort. But for Mirabai Chanu, her coach, the federation, um, uh, I think it was 10 years of effort that went into that. So, uh, uh, just an amazing success story of someone who lost at, at Rio, came back from defeat, showed so much resilience and courage uh, uh, to come back and win the Olympic silver medal. And three months after the Tokyo Olympics, they had the weightlifting national championship. The number of girls that have participated has, I think, tripled. Wow. Just because of a hero and role model like Mirabai Chanu. And that's what I'm saying. Just the inspirational value and the belief that uh, achievers like Saina Nehwal, Mirabai Chanu, Mary Kom give to young girls and young boys out there is something that maybe money can never buy. Yeah. I, that I, drive is also, sorry. The drive also is, I think, comes from a very different place. I think, uh, wherein maybe worth talking about the story of Vinesh, right? On what drives her. And when she, I think it was World Championship Bronze and you, she was speaking to Neha and the team and she was talking about what drives her. Maybe worth telling that story on why she is interested in putting India and Haryana on the map. Yeah. Because what it does to, uh, I, I, I think you know the story best, you know, what it does to the girls back in her village uh, is amazing. Yeah, um, you know, I think this Vinesh is there's someone for me who has uh, not some who, not someone who just has courage on the wrestling mat, but so much off the field yeah. uh, 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 as well. And uh, I remember there was a oh, Vinesh, if you remember that point of time, was a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, yeah. Asian Games gold medalist, and she went on to win a World Championship medal. If if I'm not mistaken, I think she was the first female wrestler, That's I think, right. to win a, That's right. a, a world Our championship medal. very popular through the movie. Yes, yeah. but no one had won the world championship medal and she won a bronze medal. And Vinesh Fogart stood on the on the world championship pod podium, bronze medal around her neck and she was not smiling at all. And some uh, a journalist asked, asked her, you have, you have just become the first female athlete to win a world championship medal and why are you not smiling? <laughs> And she said, Ki, uh, you know, my target is the gold. 
So I will smile when I win the gold medal. And I just loved the ambition and the hunger and the fire to not be satisfied because I think we as a nation, in general, growing up in those 90s, 2000s, I thought we got we were satisfied too early. We didn't have the killer instinct to beat the Australias and Germanys and Hollands of of the world. So I just loved the fact that athletes like Vinish Fogart are showing the way. and um, there's so much hunger and fire and desire uh, and it's our duty and responsibility to ensure that that talent is really channelized in the right direction and we give them the right uh, platform and uh, uh, you know vinesh as well says that in her village girls are still getting married off at uh, uh, 17 and 18 years old and what she does just gives hope to so many young girls uh to keep on fighting and and keep on believing that there's so much more in in life to do than just getting uh, married at, at at 17 and 18 so just incredibly tough uh, uh, women women role models uh showing so much courage and resilience so i think that's just amazing yeah for them it's not a movie tagline chori choro se kam hai ke it's really what they live every, every day. day yeah Yeah, yeah, I think that comes from a place which I don't know if men can honestly match right? like that intensity. I was actually thinking about Meera Bai Chanu, and you, you you spoke about her coach briefly. I don't know if you remember the moment where she did the lift, uh, and this was being telecast, I, I, you know, on television, and um, I remember distinctly that the moment she successfully did it, and then for a one or two second period after that, I think she had to hold it and. you could hear her coach scream uthale like i think uthale mira uthale like he she he said and that voice reverberated inside that entire yeah, uh that entire uh, you know yeah. uh, stadium and the moment she had held it and she had successfully done it you could see the smile and the tears flowing down her yeah. face yeah, yeah. she dropped it and and they could just and just the natural humility of which she and so many like mary and you know all of them have she could you could see that it was just so much i think for olympic medals right yeah like if you look at other sports which are not like cricket for example there is a there is frequent matches yeah, yeah, and yeah. frequent chances to recover but here is to lose it you wait for four years and these four years are crazy in terms of training and injury and working hard and then in that moment it just that releases i can't imagine I, I think Chandra, you you told me once in uh, 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 in the initial days that we had met that I don't know how y'all uh, y'all do this because uh, how do you wait for four years and and the thing with Olympic sport is right now we're already achieving at the Commonwealth Games level, Asian Games level, we are world winning world championship medal, especially in Commonwealth Games, Asian Games, we are winning medals by the bucket load. So that bastion has been conquered. but the olympics where 205 of the best nations in the world are coming and com- competing we are still winning just a minuscule number of of medals and just that uh, because of the lack of frequency so once in 4 years and especially in physical sports like mine in hockey or weightlifting or boxing 4 years is an eternity yeah uh, you don't know whether you'll be fit enough you'll do, you don't know whether you'll get injuries and that just piles on the pressure and that pressure in most cases is actually manifested by lack of sleep the biggest challenge that we face in dealing with elite athletes is lack of sleep because of the pressure so we have 10 15 20 potential medal winners in the country and i know uh G- gagan used to tell me gagan narang who was the first athlete supported by ogq yeah uh back in the day and gagan used to say the pressure on him was so hard in 2008 beijing where he did not win the Olymp- uh, uh, olympic medal and then he went well, on I to think. win a- in london the bronze medal in 10 meter airfield in the 6 months in the lead up to london everyone would tell him ki everywhere he went he had dinner he had he went outside beta shabash is is bar to gold pakka hai is bar gold confirm hai <laughs> medal to jeetna hi hai and it's okay someone tells you once twice but imagine wherever you go someone tells you is bar to gold confirm and that just keeps on piling the pressure because we have such few potential olympic medal winners 
एंड इफ इज एवरी वन सेंग गोल्ड कन्फर्म गोल्ड पक्के गोल्ड गोल्ड तो पक्के हैं एंड एंड दैट्स हार्ड एंड लाइक अ सेड वी कैन एवर अज्यूम ऑन ऑन स्टफ लाइक मेंटल हेल्थ एंड एंड हाउ एथलीट्स आर हैंडलिंग दैट प्रेशर एंड एंड जनरली स्लीप इशूज आर द बिगेस्ट चैलेंज दैट वी फेस एंड आई थिंक दैट्स इशू दैट मोस्ट यंग पीपल फेस मोस्ट एथलीट्स फेस मोस्ट ऑफ वर्ल्ड फेस with technology and phones and and keeping us uh, awake late at night that's generally the last thing we do before we sleep or the first thing we do when we uh, we wake up in the morning so uh, managing that pressure managing technology for kids because many of these athletes they are in training camps 11 and a half months a year and they don't have any other form of entertainment the phone is their only connection to the outside world and uh, it's hard to wean them away uh, from that because after 8 7 8 hours of training a day they don't have any other form of entertainment so how do you take that only source because they need an outlet yeah as as, as well so it's a hard balance to to strike uh and it, these are just some of the challenges but the biggest pressure is because in cricket tournaments you get a big you lose the uh, world cup you still have what a big tournament the next month and yeah. the next month and the next month and people forget really quickly yeah but for olympic athletes it comes once in 4 years and when it comes the pressure is always on do you were you were just talking about you know how they need a way to decompress right these these athletes at the same time people can be fans can be pretty unforgiving and they can put stuff out there and some of the athletes we support are fairly young right a uh, shooting team for example with youngsters right first time olympians but already wo- multiple time world champions they go out there and they don't win a single medal people can be pretty brutal how is it like talking to these young athletes almost kids and helping them you know navigate through this and how do the best cope up with criticism that they see out there on social media yeah, it's it's extremely hard because you look at some of the favorites in say shooting uh, for india in the last couple of olympics jitu rai saurabh choudhury jitu rai in 2016 saurabh choudhury and manu bakar in uh, uh, 2021 at uh, the tokyo olympics and unfortunately uh, they did not perform to the level that was expected of them and they did not win a medal but you know that happens to all of us every single day you cannot perform at the highest level unfortunately they did not perform when it really mattered and the kind of i think trolling and abuse that they got sometimes we forget that these are 19 20 year olds and uh, if you look back at our time yeah. uh, uh, that is barely in college at uh, in those days and it, and and it's hard for uh, for 19 20 year olds to handle the kind of pressure and the burden of expectations that they follow no one wants to lose intentionally everyone tries their best so um, it is just hard in in terms of coping i think everyone has their own coping mechanisms uh the handling pressure uh, and coping with it is a big issue I would not say just in indian sport but in 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 world sport yeah. altogether uh, simon biles uh, uh, took a, 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 a break for to deal with her own mental health issues uh, uh, osaka has done it now uh, yes uh, absolutely osaka as, as well and and michael so felt M- michael felt uh, as well so it's it's a challenge that everyone faces and we just need to ensure that we have we create an environment which is conducive to excellence which also takes care of the physical and mental health of of all our athletes and for that a big part of it is just getting the right people involved in in sport be it uh, the entire team working behind the scenes from coaches physios trainers nutritionists people in the sports federations people in ngos like ogq this it's important to get good people involved who who care about athletes and who show empathy for uh, uh, for athletes because uh, uh because that that world is brutal where it's very uh, uh, uh black or white you either win or, or or you lose and 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 that's sometimes tough for them to handle but i think this given how emotional they are right like i think it's whenever i am at ogq events when they come on stage and they talk about their stories 
they invariably break down. They, in, I, I don't know what it is about elite athletes at that level or maybe it's just the pressure of expectation that they put on themselves, the pressure of the occasion that molds them into this uh, when, where, when they talk about or when they re revisit those moments, they just, I think the, the, so f when you have so much pressure on yourself, then an external world that is unforgiving can, uh, can, can be actually just, yeah, yeah. I just I hope that I, I yeah, I, I think, I, I don't know, the internet is, a, is, a, is an unforgiving place, especially. I think going to people's house and someone trivially saying, gold jit ke aega, it's fine because you you can kind of say that okay, this person they may not realize the gravity of what yeah. an elite sport. In most of in most cases they do not realize uh, yeah. because uh, it just so happens that a thousand other people are saying the same thing. They don't they don't and they're not doing it with any bad intention. Right. Yeah. But in the case of in internet, like some, yeah. you know, you do something wrong or you yeah, just get yeah, disqualified, yeah. and twenty five people who don't even know the sport yeah, yeah, yeah. are yeah, there's yeah, freedom yeah. of speech, right? Yeah, so. Yeah. In India, because everyone's a coach. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so then it becomes it becomes much much harder to cultivate, yeah, uh, yeah resilience, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, in the face of some old right. I think most people don't, and I don't know. Certainly, at the top, what does it take? How fine are the margins? You spoke about it from your own personal experience. There's the skill aspect. There is your physical ability, your endurance, and whatever shape your body is in, and then there's this mental aspect. I I don't know actually. What matters at the very top? Is it people sometimes say it's mental conditioning, but also sometimes the skill levels are very, very different between number one and number two. Um, if you look at badminton today, Victor's playing at a very, very different level as the rest of them. But equally in some sort, feels like anybody can beat anybody. And really, in your experience, what is it? What differentiates the people? I think it's hard to pinpoint one particular factor that goes into building Olympic champions. Uh, it will always be a combination of a hundred factors and on one particular day maybe uh, for sure the mental factor, mental toughness, resilience will definitely come out um, and they say for, for coaches es uh, especially and the life of a coach is extremely hard I feel and when you're dealing with elite athletes it's not just the technical skills you provide them is important I think at the highest level the man management skills are the most important. How you deal with athletes, how you bring out the best with them, how you deal with the tough times they're facing, how you build trust, how you communicate uh, with them. And I think the quality of a good coach is, is that coach who is able to give the athletes the tools that they can take decisions on their own mm. in the field when it matters and not spoon feed at all times. I think in India, many coaches make the mistake of trying to handle everything and spoon feeding athletes. But we don't teach them how to make decisions on their own and to have the courage to think on their own. And you don't have to look outside at the coach every single time. Because when you're out there, you're on your own. And good coaches will teach athletes to make decisions on your own. Because at that matter, you have split seconds to take a decision. Yeah, And it's how... Uh, how trained you are to take decisions when your heart rate is already at 190, 200 beats a minute where you have nothing left in the tank and you have to make the right decision at that point. What looks very easy from outside or top like a video game looks very different from when you are in there and you are running, somebody is running at you or you are running at somebody. I think it was uh, Mukesh Kumar or someone, it was a story once that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that uh, you know goes back to the day I was part of the uh, Indian national hockey uh, uh, team, and uh, we were playing. I think the Champions Trophy. Uh, Cedric D'Souza was the coach of the Indian hockey it's team. Two thousand three. Uh, two thousand one, I think. Two thousand two thousand one time. And uh, we were playing Australia the next day, and. Uh, Cedric was way ahead of his time, or a little ahead of his time. He had introduced video analysis uh, back then to help us prepare for matches. So in video analysis, you see your previous matches, you analyze your mistakes, see what you've done well, look at the opponents, try to dissect their weaknesses, where you can exploit them. So India was going to play Australia next day in the Champions Trophy. And um, uh, uh, Cedric had called us to the hotel room the night before the match to uh, to do a video analysis. 
so we all there we were sitting in the darkened hotel room everyone fighting to sit right behind yeah. in the room because you know when you see yourself on the big screen and you make a mistake <laughs> you look like an idiot <laughs> and when cedric plays it in slow motion you you look like a bigger idiot <laughs> So you know there we were all waiting for the dreaded pause button, and Cedric pauses the button, and he looks around for Mukesh Kumar. <laughs> so Mukesh, along with Dhanraj, <laughs> used to be one of India's top strikers. Yes. So Cedric pauses the video and he looks at Mukesh, and he says, tells Mukesh, Mukesh, you are such a senior, experienced khiladi. Oh, you have made such a big mistake. Look, you are seeing a clean mess. The gap was here. आपने पास वहां पे दिया तो मुकेश लुक्स एट द स्क्रीन फॉर सम टाइम एंड ही टेल सेड्रिक कोच साहब ये कैमरा कहां पे था सो सो सेड्रिक सेज तो यू नो आवर हॉकी फुटबॉल क्रिकेट द कैमरास एट अ हाइट टू गिव यू अ बर्ड्स आई व्यू ऑफ द ग्राउंड सो सेड्रिक सेज कैमरा तो ऊपर था तो मुकेश लुक्स एट द स्क्रीन अगेन फॉर सम टाइम एंड देन ही टर्न्स अराउंड एंड टेल सेड्रिक कोच साहब जब ऑस्ट्रेलिया के साथ मैच खेलते हैं ना जब ओपन से मैच देखा तो गैप ही गैप दिखते हैं <laughs> नीचे आके ग्राउंड पे खेलो ना गैप ही नहीं दिखते एंड एंड यू नो दैट वाज एक्चुअली ट्रू बिकॉज आई एज प्लेड अगेंस्ट ऑस्ट्रेलिया अबाउट 20 25 टाइम्स इन माय करियर आई 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 यूज्ड टू बी अ सेंटर हाफ एंड मिडफील्डर प्लेइंग इन द मिडिल ऑफ द ग्राउंड थिक ऑफ द एक्शन एंड एवरी टाइम आई गॉट द बॉल एंड आई लुकड अप the blue shots are not visible only only the yellow shots are visible wow. because in the match australia don't give you time to think they don't give you time to breathe they don't give you time to look up and it and you know when cedric was seeing it rightly from his vantage point from 10000 feet up in the air gap was here but when you on the ground you can't see it. the 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 situation is very different just the pace the intensity the pressure you're under at all times if you waste a split second that gap closes that window closes very quickly yeah. and it actually got me thinking in india at that point i'm talking about early 2000s are we training right are we preparing with the right quality and intensity in every training session the kind of intensity and pressure that we will face in match situations where like i said you're making decisions every single minute mm. in the match and uh, uh uh i think someone i i can't remember who said raul ki in a hockey match or football match uh i think you want a crave said it in a football match that each player gets the ball about 2 minutes in a 90 minute match yeah. what matters is what you do those other 88 yeah. minutes when the ball is not with you yeah. and and uh, and how you think how you help the team and what is your role during that time so uh, it, 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 so i think sometimes when you look at things from up and there it's very different when you actually go to the ground level it's a whole different situation you know i was reading this book called uh, the ta- i think you gave me the book the talent factory uh, it's the uk uh, how uk turned around their olympic situation i think 96 olympics they won a single gold me- gold medal right and they came like like we are uk we can't be winning one gold medal and then they directed a lot of the national lottery funds towards it but what they did after that was quite instructive so they were very open they were saying current methods aren't working so each sport let's decentralize let's there'll be a big program but there'll be a lot of autonomy at the sport level i think uh, it was in the i think it was hockey women's hockey where the coach was putting them through situations that were helping them prepare for what will happen in a game for example there'll be i think match thursdays or something or match saturdays and suddenly you'll be given one surprise on the day so you've been divided into camps and on that day you've been told this player is injured yeah yeah so that player is not available so all your plan yeah you yeah. know goes out of the window now you've got to adapt yeah. suddenly in the just before you enter he'll say actually today we were supposed to play a match but we'll actually be playing 6 on 5 drill yeah and you are only defending with 5 yeah so it's a situation where you know you've got a yellow card what do you do you have to survive 5 minutes or 10 yeah, minutes yeah, yeah. against a team that's relentless and fresh yeah yeah i think so those methods just Absolutely. i think that's what you're kind of talking about how do you Be- because in sport no matter how much you prepare when you finally go on the field 
nothing ever goes to plan yeah, yeah everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face <laughs> the great mike tyson said that yes. so so uh, it's it's just about adapting and adapting very quickly and uh, just being able to deal with uncertainty is again one of the biggest qualities of that make players really great so uh, i want to actually ask you about this a little bit no like I, and i see this with actually if you were to draw parallel we, and we talk about this a lot you draw parallel between founders and and athletes uh, that you know athletes need constant nutrition like constant cajoling constant um, you know motivation belief that they are the best right because they are looking for extraordinary outcomes which where the odds are broadly stacked against them because they are competing in very minimal environment and it's competitive Similar to founders, you're kind of trying to create extraordinary outcomes where all that are stacked against you. One of the things that I think helps both of these is uh, uh, is is a sense of is an ego or a sense of self-esteem or a sense of self-worth, which is actually very 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 large. Do you see this with athletes and uh, you know and in a, in a team sport like hockey where you are the captain and there are clearly stars in the team how do you flame that ego and kind of keep it going because that's what really makes you great at the same time uh not control but guide it in a way where it is helpful for people in the team so i just wanted to kind of because even with founders for example the boards or your teams are always stoking it but can also kind of The, one of the important things is to make sure that it's never out of control. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, you know, I think is that a fair observation to start there? You know, uh, ab- absolutely, because I think all the top players or the greatest players I've seen are in some way mavericks or eccentric. And if I look at Dhanraj Pillai, M C Mary Com, uh. all of them are little bit eccentric they are eccentric geniuses and i would never ever take away that quality from them because that what's uh, that's what makes them so great in a way uh and if if you look at uh, mary gong if if you see her or meet her off the boxing ring she is the most humble and nicest person you would ever know and the moment she puts on the boxing gloves and steps into the ring i think the avatar changes there's a totally instant new and different person and just the there's a, it's it's like a different persona altogether has come over her and she just has this fierce belief that she is the best and the way she struts into the boxing ring like this is her home and this belongs to her and she is the best and everyone else is a challenger <laughs> and i love that uh, i love that attitude in 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 her and and same with 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 dhanraj pille I, i i was just the you know for me it was the biggest fanboy moment actually to get, to get to play with him because i remember once when i was in school i was uh, 13 years old and the indian men's hockey team had come to my school st anastasia high school to play an exhibition match one evening and uh, you know exams were on but i troubled the hell out of my parents to allow me to uh, go and watch the match and after i watched the match i uh, i was one of the 500 people who went and up and shook hands with dhanraj wow. obviously he never remembered that but for a 13 year old me who uh, uh who I wanted to play hockey uh, and idolized him it was uh, i think i didn't wash my hands for two days <laughs> and then six years later i was playing with dhanraj in the indian hockey team so uh, 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 for me it was an incredible uh, uh, moments but i just learned so much from him in when you went on the pitch just have the belief that you can do what you want Uh, to do and and execute with confidence and uh, i think he was again ahead of his time because he was just a magician and a wizard on the hockey pitch he could make things happen out of nothing and indian hockey was not used to that at uh, uh, <laughs> at the global level because we just struggled so much in the 90s and and 2000s 
that was a hard time for Indian hockey. But um, I think he was one of those players who would they say, you, you know, you can get uh, bums uh, at the edge of seats. And, and uh, oh, yeah. you know, we played India-Pakistan matches all over the world. How was that? Yeah. How nice. <laughs> and, and, and that was just the most uh, amazing experience. I, I remember the... Uh, Raul, you might have watched it, the, the the match where India beat Pakistan 7-4 in Amsterdam. I did. Uh, the, that was the Amsterdam Champions Trophy. And Jukraj uh, was... Uh, yeah, Jukraj was, uh, was in his prime at that point of time. Dandraj was in the team. I think it was a fantastic Indian team. And uh, Pakistan were leading us 4-2 in the first half. And we came back and scored five goals in, in, in the second half, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I, yeah, I had the privilege of playing that entire match. And... You know, the full stadium in Holland in Amsterdam was filled with Indians and Pakistanis. And uh, the joke was that uh, we didn't keep our feet on the ground after our match because all the Indian fans lifted us up and we reached the hotel on their shoulders. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, so, you know, that was fun experience. But, you know, another great experience of India-Pakistan, Rahul was, um, was at the... So, after the 2004 Athens Olympics, there was an India-Pakistan test series. Uh, so, four matches in Pakistan, four matches in India. And we played in Pakistan first. Now, that was the first bilateral series in any sport that India played against Pakistan after the Kargil War. Mm. So, tension on both sides of the border was huge. There was massive security for the Indian team when we went to Pakistan. Uh, and... Our first match, I think, was in Lahore, at the Lahore National Stadium, which had like a 50-60,000 capacity. Terrible. So, uh, uh, and that match finished 3-all. And I remember, uh, so, 50,000 Pakistani spectators at Lahore Stadium, whenever Pakistan scored a goal and they scored three, the fans raised the roof of the stadium. And whenever India scored a goal, which was thrice, there was pin drop silence in a 50,000 stadium. Wow. So, you know, that memory always stayed with me <laughs> ki, uh, uh, to silence a 50,000 fans. So, just some amazing <laughs> memories uh, 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 from, uh, from that time. And uh, I remember also uh, in that series, at Chan uh, Chan we had a match at Chandigarh uh, in the Sector 42 stadium. And... In Punjab hockey is really popular and from the hotel to the stadium, fans had lined the streets, they climbed the trees in the stadium, they were sitting on the roof of the stadium, again climb the trees uh, outside the stadium and you walk out of the dugout and you line up before the match and 40,000 people sing the Janagana Mana. That is the just most incredible feeling uh, that you ever get. You get goosebumps when uh, 40,000 people sing the Jana Jana Mana. And you're about to enter into battle with Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I think those kind of memories are something that will always Did you know, did you foster friendships with uh, people in the Pakistani team, with, with their athletes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I was very good friends with Soil Abbas. So one the drag flicker, right? The, the greatest drag flickers. He, he still holds the world record for the highest. Him and Jogar, who, would you, who would you kind of... It, gun, it, it, gun to your head, who would you bet your final breath? It, 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 it's hard. Both were amazing players. It was such a big loss for India that Jugaraj had that injury. Uh, but you know, I want to uh, uh, tell you a story about Soil Abbas's world record goal, which happened in that same 2004 India-Pakistan Test Series in Amritsar. So, uh, I was standing, I used to defend penalty corners, standing on the goal line. That's the hardest job. <laughs> yeah. And at that time, if you're, there are no you face die. masks. We can die, right? You, you when Soyal Abbas is... <laughs> not, yeah. You can, yeah. Let's just say that it's not one of the most pleasant experiences of my life. <laughs> but, uh, so I was standing on the goal line, Adrian was in the goal, and uh, uh, Soyal was just raining in goals that entire series. No one in the world had found the solutions to stop him. And Adrian at that time was the first goalkeeper in world hockey who was to charge out. Uh, to, it's very difficult for the goalkeeper with those heavy kit and pads to charge out and run and narrow down the angle it there. So, Amritsar match, Soil had equalized the, equaled the world record in Pakistan. We came to Amritsar. He had a chance to break the world record. Adrian then 
we'll do everything to stop him <laughs> and uh, he had played brilliant he did was spectacular that series and um, so he didn't charge pa- pakistan got the penalty corner he didn't charged out the ball went under his arm and it came straight to once my head <laughs> at 200 kilometers per hour i was standing on the goal line and that time there was no face mask i was not wearing gum guards we didn't have those in india at those point of time and i ducked i just ducked this much and i i'm not kidding you shantanu i had hair at that time i literally felt the brain <laughs> and uh the ball there were two nets in the goal the ball broke through both the nets and hit the advertising hoardings good lord it went so fast that the referee because it hit the advertising hoardings behind the referee thought that it went from above the goal and it was out but i knew my height and i knew the bar was this much above me so it had gone just above me because it was coming straight from my head so the pakistani players protested they said ask him ask him <laughs> the referee asked me i said goal uh, if i had to not duck that that day i wouldn't have been sitting here talking <laughs> talk, talking to you all so uh, and, yeah. and for the viewers of not played hockey the hockey ball is it's concrete yeah, yeah, it's not a tennis ball yeah. it's not, yeah. <laughs> is it yeah. harder than a cricket ball it's much harder it's much harder yeah 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 yeah, yeah. it gets you're gone like, yeah here yeah. i used to play amateur hockey in college that's why they don't allow, they don't allow you to play international hockey without shin pads as well so Yeah, and but you can still. There's so many ways you can get. Have yeah. you like broken your hands and fingers? I've, I'm, I'm, I've, I've had four fractures on the fingers of my right hand. Okay, the ball, the ball. Yeah, you, you either get hit with the ball or the stick. So, uh, finger fractures are very common. In, in I think you told me the thumb fractures the hardest. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, once I I got hit with the ball on the thumb so badly, I could not bend my thumb for. Uh, I could not actually hold a glass of water for three months. so i had no strength in my thumb to even hold a glass of water so uh, uh, sometimes injuries were so hard and back in the day we didn't have good doctors or uh, the best physio treating you and rehabbing i didn't know that you could you, you had to even rehab your finger uh, as as much and now things have improved so much in ogq this is one of our big areas right on rehab you spoke about um, sindhu but i'm sure there are several others where absolutely i think the injury situation both science and having the best team of physios trainers nutritionists that work behind the scenes like with mirabai janu with mary com and so many athletes lakshya sen uh, today i think some of these athletes today have the best teams in the world working behind the scenes and i think to build champions it's not just the coach or the athlete it's an army of people working behind the scenes and every single person has to be world class in their respective role because we cannot expect pv sindhu or lakshya sen or or, or mary com to go out there and compete against the best in the world and win olympic medals if the people working behind the scenes are an average physio or an average strength and conditioning expert yeah. or nutritionist everyone working behind the scenes has to be world class because like i said finally it boils down to the one percenters and we have to ensure we take all those boxes how has the changed our approach in ogq earlier you remember we i think first year 12 athletes or so was sort of the batch we got lucky with gagan mary saina and everyone vijay kumar vijay kumar right yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you know it's changed over time right at some point time we have to start enabling folks who will enable these athletes yeah, as yeah. as opposed to just enabling the athletes directly we are starting to support entire programs Yeah, there's yeah. been some change there. Maybe talk about that and how that's that's uh, yeah, worked I, out. Yeah, I think when we started uh, back in 2008-9 time onwards, we were solely supporting individual athletes. But now I think what we have learned is uh, to support. We're trying to get a whole host of athletes together under one roof because then you can actually concentrate world class support towards that uh, athletes. So OGQ is now supporting the. Uh, national center of excellence for cycling as a new sport uh, that we're looking for uh, maybe medals in 28 or 32 or we are working very closely with the boxing federation for sports science you recently saw four women boxers winning gold medals at the world championship j- uh, just last week in in yes. delhi yep. so uh, i think uh, so the entire sports science team working behind the scenes or many of them working behind the 
since our uh, uh, OG is supported. So we're trying to work very closely with the system, with the government, with the national sports federations. In fact, I would say Mirabai Chanu is the best example of how the Sports Authority of India, the uh, Weightlifting Federation and OGQ came together. Many stakeholders coming together to ensure that all the gaps in the training for uh, uh, to, to provide world-class support to an athlete is taken care of. So I think one of the big lessons we have learned is collaboration with the different stakeholders. So whether we are, uh, currently OGQ is working very closely with the Boxing Federation and Shooting Federation, Archery Federation on sports science as well as coaching support. Sports science and coaching are areas that I would say is what we bring to the table. Is our, That's our biggest strengths and areas of expertise. Yeah. But just collaboration, collaboration, collaboration is important. If we bring a bunch of talented kids together when they are 14, 15, 16 and put the right processes in place, I'm very sure in a eight year period, the process will generate results. Yeah. And that is what will give India medals. Apart from this this change, I think the other big change from 2009 when, when you took over as CEO is also how far the junior program has come. Yeah. Right? Earlier it was a lot. We were supporting G Gagan, right? He was already somebody. He'd been an Olympian. We are helping him become, uh, go from India's best to world class, right? World's best. Uh, now it's a lot about finding these people young. Yeah. So, you know, tons of questions on that. How yeah. do we find them? Um, do we have do we have good hit rates? What are some of the most amazing stories that have come out? Maybe tell people a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to say, uh, Shantanu, that Rahul put the initial initial research structure in place because back then in two thousand and nine, I remember the first two athletes I gave uh, uh, Rahul uh, research reports was a shooter, uh, Tejaswini uh, Savant. And one uh, uh, and one research report to do on sailing. Sailor, yeah. And uh, I think Rahul put the structure in place at that time for OGQ to help us understand the sports we need to be in. And we decided our focus sports at that point of time would be badminton, boxing, shooting, archery and wrestling. Mm. These five sports. Because it's... Uh, as important as uh, it is to decide on your focus areas, it's equally important for an organization to decide what not to be in. Yeah. And uh, sailing at that point of time was not one of those sports. So uh, uh, so, so I think uh, uh, a big credit goes to Raul at that point of time. In, I think in terms of the junior program, we were really serious about it after the 2012 London Olympics, where right. we put a very structured approach to identifying the most talented junior athletes. And we had already started in 2011 with Lakshya. Lakshya was the first junior athlete. How, how old was Lakshya? He was 10 years old, uh, Shantanu. And at that time, Lakshya Sen was literally coming to my waist. And so today to see him, uh, of course, he's just out of the top 10 in the world. But until uh, recently, he was the youngest player in the top 10 in the world, Commonwealth Games gold medalist. And to see that journey over 11 years, and like I said, just process, process, process. We identified a young talent, put the right processes over 10 years. The process generated results. In terms of stats, Rahul, in the Tokyo Olympics 2020, 29 athletes supported by OGQ participated. 16 of them came through our junior program. Wow. So Ravi Kumar, we started supporting him when he was 16 years old. Deepak Punya, when... He was 15 years old. Uh, Anshu and Sonam wrestlers when they were 15 years uh, old. Sindhu when she was 14 years old. So, like I said, I think for India as a nation, we, there is massive, there's a massive talent pool. But it's just about putting structure and the right processes and the right people in place. Well, what do you look for when you look, look at a... I think one is, of course, performance and, you know, there is just... But how do you how do you differentiate a thirteen year old who can potentially become a world beater at twenty or twenty four? Uh, what do you what do you see in them when they're twelve or thirteen? Because they're not physically fully there yet, and there's a lot of things around mindset. There's a lot of things around longevity and potential. Of course, in addition to physical and mental strength. Yeah. How how what do you what do you look for? 
Uh, that's, that's a hard one. I, I, you know, I wish I had the answers and I could crack that one. So, so on one side, you look at our research team looks at, we're tracking in our focus sports. So one, the first filter is obviously Olympic sport. Second filter is individual Olympic sport. Third filters we look at, uh, generally athletes from uh, our focus sports are, like I said, badminton, boxing, shooting, archery, wrestling. But we also support a few outliers. So Mirabai Chanu is an outlier yeah. in weightlifting. Uh, we support a couple of table tennis players, couple of swimmers, four or five from uh, athletics. Athletics are 45 events, but we support maybe a few javelin throwers, a few young uh, uh, jumpers, long jump and, and triple jump. So we focus on events where we think that eight, 10 years down the line, yeah. we can potentially win medals. So one is to look at results. We look at consistency of performance also, because and not just one-off performances. But after you do that, there are many other factors and the qualitative factors that are equally important. And we talk a lot to experts in the field, talk a lot to coaches, look, uh, look at the kind of background and support systems they have had in place to come to that level. Because in many sports like archery and shooting, most of the athletes come from poor areas. So say archers come from Jharkhand, Sikkim. small villages in Jharkhand and Sikkim. Growing up, they have not had the right kind of equipment. A young 13-year-old archer coming from a small village in Jharkhand cannot afford archery equipment that costs 4 lakhs. And so how is it a level, level playing yeah. field? You, we can't benchmark it with international scores. When growing up, they have not had the right kind of equipment or training or nutrition or stuff like that. So we have to... Ideally, you would want to be very objective, but in India, there's no choice uh, but to be a little bit more subjective in our, our, our research. But what do you see in like what do you see in the athlete themselves? Uh, I think that's hunger and fire and passion. But how do you uh, think just it's hard to put my finger to it, but generally you can see it from from discipline, from behavior, from drive. And uh, uh, it's hard to define that, but generally you know it when you see it. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's something I love doing. I love talking to young kids and understanding what drives them and understanding. Uh, but but I have to add here, Shantanu, also that one thing that is also a big learning point is to ensure that young kids uh, also just continue to love the sport. Yeah. Sometimes at a very young age, when you put too much structure, too much process, it just kills the joy of playing. And that's one thing that we never want to do is in, we don't want our young, our most talented young kids going at 6 a.m. to the training ground and saying, oh gosh, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I, I, I hate it. And, you know, it's, it's a fine balance between hunger and fire and enjoying, they also keep ensuring that they keep on loving the sport. More so because we all know that challenges will come and yeah. they just get bigger and bigger as you get to senior. Yeah. I went through this actually personally, not that, you know, son would have would have played or can play at, you know, it's, you know, that's not necessarily a possibility. But I think for uh, for my son Kabir, I uh, uh, pushed chess too hard. Yeah. Because I thought I played well when I was young. And if I had had the opportunity, I think that was weighing down on me. Yeah, yeah. Let me give the best possible opportunity. I, he needs to have a coach when he's six. Yeah. Start playing. I think that overstructuring over that six month period. Yeah. Actually, actually killed his joy in the sport because yeah, yeah. he would just come and I got to show up for a class. I'm losing. I don't like losing to my coach. Yeah. And, yeah, on, yeah. and he gave up chess altogether in a year. So in football, I tried not to make the same mistake. And yeah. I think that what you spoke about, really letting kids be yeah. Yeah, and yeah. enjoy know yeah. why they came to the sport in the first place yeah i yeah. think it's, uh, it's i think it's a fine line and it's tough for parents and uh, but you know one thing that is never an issue is just getting more and more kids to play and i think many parents these days are realizing the value of sport because if 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 if, if i just look at my own example i think this sport taught me so many lessons and i i'll just give an example going back to marcellus gomes where I was 11 years old, I, uh, our school hockey training used to start at 6.30 in the morning. And I used to go on my cycle to school. And one day the chain of my cycle 
came out and they were sitting in the road fixing the chain and I finally got it done. I reached hockey training at 6.35 in the morning and he kept me out of training for the full training session and that hurt me so much. From that day onwards, I have never been late ever for any any, any team meeting ever <laughs> or any meeting in my life. Wow. And just so, so time discipline in this case. <coughs> and in India, we all know how much value people give to time. So this, I think discipline, uh, time, uh, discipline, commitment, I think to be able to focus, to be goal oriented, teamwork, communication, this sport teaches you so many lessons that maybe the classroom can never teach you. And no, for sure. Like I used to play football at no, no, no level comparable to yours. But I was consistent. I used to play at school level, then at school club, then uh, in Pune, then college. I've made my best friends yeah, to yeah. date on the football field. Genuinely, I've like more than what I did at work or in college or in school on on the sporting field because sport brings out character in ways that no education can, in my view. No platform education can. Absolutely. And I think that's something that, and we were talking about this offline as well, which is parents today think of sport as like a choice between sport or like or focus study. on studies and don't yeah, do yeah, sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is just so off because I think sports enhances character in ways. Well, for sure. I think, uh, the, you know, and also I think there's a myth that parents say that if you play sport, you can't study. study. Yeah. I think uh, there's no nothing further away from the throat because I think the sport teaches you to be disciplined, to manage your time effectively, to be focused. I think in in fact, if nothing else, it it improves your uh, your focus on right. on studies. So I think all the parents out there, yeah. I would love it if if all parents just encourage their kids uh, uh, to play any sport, especially a team sport. Just teaches you so many uh, life lessons. My oh. senses for privileged kids, by the way, it is probably in my mind one of the only ways to give them a level playing field. Yeah. Where they can get a real sense of what it is like to operate without privilege. Yeah. Otherwise, the conversation always is which car are you driving? Is your yeah. pay- That's the early conversations in schools these days, right? Really? Yes, it is. Right? What? And that's so you're always, you don't realize how much of privilege you're already standing on. It's only when you step across the white line yeah, yeah. in a sports field that score is going to be 0 0, no matter whose kid you are or where you've come from. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Within this box, what you do within the box will define how much respect you get from your teammates, yeah. how happy you are, and who's on the winning side. I think that's incredibly important. Sports yeah. is one of the only level playing fields, I think, left. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I, I never thought about that. Mm-hmm. I've only come here for example. And, and also the resilience it teaches you, right? Which other field do you get where you lose so much in life? I think for sure I've lost much more than I've won in life. And um, uh, and I think th- that's why, I, even when I was at ISB, ISB is a tough year. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the course is hard, you're always under pressure, even submitting assignments on time. But for me, I found that actually a fairly easy year because I was used to already dealing and handling much more pressure. Yeah, between handling like a Sohail Abbas shot <laughs> that went across the net and saying you are you have to deliver this assignment, I think my choice is pretty clear. No, but I, I just, uh, you know, sometimes I felt that there were so many future corporate leaders of the country fighting for half mark uh, from the TA. On, 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 on. And I found it so ridiculous. <laughs> and, and sometimes I feel that there's just so much more in life. Future corporate leaders. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So, uh, so just the resilience that you learn and the ability to come back from defeat, that's just been one of the biggest lessons. Well, I want to actually come back to, um, uh, come, come, back, come back to, you know, pre-ISB, which is, uh, you know, giving up or retiring from sport earlier than most athletes would. At an age where many people would consider it near your prime or maybe slightly past. I don't know what, what the prime is in a sport like hockey, but how hard was that? And what, what led you to say, okay, fine, you know, when you went to one Olympics, the other one was kind of around the corner. Uh, clearly, you had friends and, you know, uh, the, you know, the joy of sport was absolutely up there. But to say, hey, I'm going to hang this up, but now I want to do something else. Yeah. Talk us through that. Like, I'm sure it was not 
uh, impulse thing. It would have taken a few years to. Kind oh, of... for sure. I think it was a hard decision because from the time I was 18, 19, got into the Indian junior team and I retired at 27, which was, yes, uh, much earlier than expected. If I wanted to, I could play another Olympic cycle and maybe another as well. So, uh, 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 yeah, it, it's a funny story going back to when I was 15 years old because uh, in in my SSC board exams, uh, I, I I got 91% or something like that and I stood 13th on the Mumbai SSC merit list. Wow. And at that time, uh, again, this was 90s, so my mom was a doctor, elder brothers were engineers, everyone told me how to become doctor, engineer. <laughs> and here was me, I wanted to play hockey. <laughs> so at that time, everyone wanted me to study, I wanted to play hockey. And at 27, when I decided to retire, I could have easily played uh, another Olympic or two Olympic cycles more. That time, everyone wanted me to play and I wanted to study. So, you know, it, it was as if life came a full cycle. Uh, but you're right, Chantanu. I actually thought about it for a long time because since the time I graduated at 21, I finished my BCom till I retired. And actually, a few years before that also, I had not opened a book. Uh, in in the seven eight years because I, uh, eleven and a half months I was on the road yeah. training traveling playing and you know at that point time try to open a book you fall asleep very quickly <laughs> uh, and uh, so you know I was I had self doubts would I be able to cope with the pressure of ISB would I be able to uh, cope up uh, with that sort of intensity and finally I just decided to take the leap into the sort of unknown. And you know, I'm in, in hindsight, that was the best decision I did because I quit at, uh, at my peak. I, I just sort of th felt that I've given everything I could give as a player. And I wanted to leave when I still felt that I was playing good hockey and not when I was really on the decline. And I can understand it's a hard decision for many athletes because very often that's the only skill set they have and uh, it's it's tough to sort of take that leap into the unknown. So yeah, many people thought I was mad when I quit at 27 and decided uh, to st uh, study at that point of time. Many thought I was equally mad where after ISB, um, I ditched a conventional corporate job, campus placement. Uh, where where, where I, you were you going to I I I don't want to say that, but uh, <laughs> well, um, but it was a fairly uh, a lucrative uh, position, and you know I asked me to pay a big loan, <laughs> and I had to uh, take care of the uh, student loan, and you know I was joining a not-for-profit organization that had no track record, uh, no money, uh, nothing. So um, I think there were many times where people felt that I was crazy, but I think I just believe that very often you just got to follow your heart and what you love doing and if I listened to people in life I don't think I've ever played uh, for the Indian hockey team. Yeah. So no regrets on that one? Oh absolutely uh, not. I think with nothing in life I wouldn't change uh, 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 anything at all. I'm sure you've had many other offers along the way so it's not a one-time decision <laughs> right after ASB. Frankly I, there is no one like you right yeah. to have that sort of combination of playing at the very top in world sport Having a world-class degree, right? ISB is a fantastic school. Having this experience, you've never thought about doing something else uh, other than OGQ? Um, I think what I've decided, so, so I've, I've had a lot of job opportunities, offers over okay. the years, especially in the last few years. Um, but I think one thing what I realize is whatever I do, I want to do it in sport. And preferably in, in, in elite sport, I think what I feel are my best skill sets and what I can contribute most to the country is to give back to sport and to, uh, to ensure that the mistakes that were done during my time are not repeated for the next generation of athletes. And right now, what better way than through OGQ is a wonderful platform, I think. I'm really grateful to Geet Sethi and Prakash Padukone and Vishy Anand for, uh, for creating this organization and this platform and all the corporate other corporate leaders that are part of our board. So uh, I, I wish we had an OGQ in, 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 in my time at that point of time. But I also have to say that in the last decade, especially the, the government support has been far better 
the quality that organizations like the Sports Authority of India are doing, the level of support. I'm part of the Mission Olympic Cell, yeah. which is the highest government body that looks after Olympic preparations. Uh, every two weeks, there's a meeting and uh, proposal from athletes for their Paris Olympic preparations are discussed in depth, in detail. There's much more quick decision making. Funds are released on time. The, the kind of support staff, the kind of systems and processes and structures are much better. So I think uh, Indian Olympic sport is on the upswing. But there's just so much more to do. Yeah, I there is. I think in India there's a room for a hundred more OGQs. I hope they're, they're, look, uh, right from grassroots level sport to intermediate sport to elite sport at yeah. every single level, especially women's sport, Paralympic sport. Yeah, we haven't spoken about that. Yeah. That's a that's been a very gratifying, you know, experience for for the team at OGQ. I think when did we do the uh, para program in, in uh, 2019? Right around the first that was the first championships yeah, yeah, yeah. we went for, and our athletes have done incredibly well. I think India won what 19 medals or so, and OGQ supported 10 of yep. those medalists. Yes. Uh, talk about some of them and what, what did you oh, learn from them? I think again, uh, like, like I said, the most gratifying, humbling experience to support uh, para-athletes and uh, especially given the fact that I feel over the years, para-athletes have just not got any support or recognition uh, at all. Um, we researched for, or they, we took the decision to try and support para-athletes in 2018, but we said, Ki, let's uh, research, first understand Para sport, understand classifications. Um, much of these uh, para athletes have uh, either upper limb amputations, lower limb amputations. Some of them are on wheelchairs. But just again, the courage and fire and yeah. determination. Also, want to say uh, that we do not support the para athletes based on their disabilities. We support them on their abilities. Uh, the one of the such a powerful then one of the para athletes we support is Nishad Kumar. He's a high jumper. Um, Love. Nishad has an amputated arm. He hails from Una district in Himachal Pradesh. When we started supporting Nishad, he was jump he uh, he was jumping around one point nine six meters. The qualification mark for uh, Tokyo twenty one was around two meters. Uh, we started supporting him in 2019, uh, ensured that he had a good coach, the right physio, trainer, nutritionist, put all the processes. We sent him to Dubai. He had no support at that time to even go for the Olympic qualification event. He went there. He uh, After the right training, he jumped 2.01 meter. Then, of course, pandemic hit. The, the Paralympics got postponed by a year. When he finally went to Tokyo, Nishad jumped 2.06 meters to win the Paralympic silver medal in high jump. Shantanu, 2.06 meters, that's like one meter above your head with an amputated arm. So, uh, sorry, one foot above your head with an amputated arm. And that, that's, for me, that's unthinkable uh, to do that. We, uh, uh, the, the government and OGQ together, we sent him to uh, the US recently. Uh, we provided, again, the right sports science team, government, to care of all the funding. We sent him to one of the best high jumping coaches in the US, uh, to Chula Vista, where he trains. He recently took part in an abled bodied event at the National Games, I think. He jumped 2.14 meters. What? Wow. 2.14 meters. That's a 8 uh, centimeter improvement from the Olympics. But the na our national record and this thing higher will be 2.26 or 2. Absolutely, or absolutely. He competed in the able-bodied event and finished fifth in 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 in, in the ground and arm. Yeah. So, uh, if what is that? My view is just simply incredible. The kind of little resilience. Nishat Kumar is the son of a farmer, and the stuff. Again, growing up, he's had no nutrition, no coaching. These people barely knew about that the Paralympic exists also. They started very late in their career. So, like I said, again, another example, if we're able to put better processes in place for our para-athletes, uh, we can do so much more. I love I love Nishad uh, for many reasons. One of my favorite things about him is how he visualizes and manifests. So, if you watch you know, him jumping, 
he's a lean figure tall yeah yeah one arm he stands there and many high jumpers do this many athletes do this but he he goes through the entire process in his head yeah yeah as that and in the end you see him yeah you, you'll see that you know he the flop happens in his head and he's cleared it yeah yeah and so that's right yeah he's, yeah he's won that battle before he's gone in there yeah yeah so yeah you love in his head it's yeah, it's yeah. one here yeah yeah before it's you know one on the mat so it's just incredible yeah uh, so humbling to meet the one what are the you know how now talking that it is so humbling to meet our athletes especially our para athletes because like krishna nagar for example yeah i know you know we were talking about his uh, his badminton gold and he was he basically said that i used to walk 7 8 kilometers uh and not take the bus because the 8 rupees i had gotten for the ticket i would save and then i would do the strip you know maybe uh 10 times and save enough for one shuttlecock yeah, yeah yeah and then i would just keep accumulating shuttlecocks because that's how there's only way i could practice yeah, yeah. and then he said that 7 kilometers for me is like 12 kilometers for you because i'm much shorter so yeah, yeah. i think those many extra steps correct and blew my mind yeah, yeah. how much sa- walking 7 kilometers for every single day one eighth of a shuttlecock yeah 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 is irrational and often i i don't think but there's no choice do. right for for him it wasn't irrational for him it was rational and he was still only take it out of yeah and he so literally save 1 rupee 1 rupee 1 rupee in coins every single day to buy his shuttle cocks and his badminton racket and he said, he told me once that when he went to the sports shop he bought the racket in coins he put 100 coins on the table and he bought the racket and shuttle cocks from that and that young boy went on to win the paralympic gold medal in a short stretch of badminton and um he said in his earlier life because of the short stature kids i mean he was bullied, bullied in a way and today those same uh, people who bullied him be- before affecting him yeah. and you know when he won the paralympic gold medal and came back to india there were 3000 people at jaipur airport uh, there to receive him so uh, again just the inspirational stories of kids like krishna nagar and nishad kumar and so, and so many more is just amazing i whenever i come to ogq event i think it's it's very palpable when um children uh 5 year 7 8 year old children are in the same room if you're, you you usually do it in a banquet hall in a in a hotel yeah. Yeah. and i love ogq events because unlike other sporting felicitations where it becomes about either sponsors or uh, politicians or whatever in this case it's always about athletes everyone else is in the background everyone else is at best an enabler but the hero is the athlete yeah. but in this case and what you do so well is children are allowed access to athletes and it's the children and the athletes in the front and you can clearly see like the impact it has on a 5 6 7 8 year old child to be in the presence of um an elite athlete and to see them in person while all you've seen before is them on tv doing extraordinary things and i wanted to ask you that you know of course you work with younger um athletes uh, through the junior program but you're also a father uh, and you know your daughter plays multiple sports I'm, i'm assuming that she is genetically uh, <laughs> gifted uh, uh, to, to 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 do that but how does it like what well, i think sure being a part of ogq and being so close to so many athletes at such a personal level gives access to your daughter <laughs> kind of get inspiration not only from you and uh, and and her mom but also from one of the athletes uh, i i have to say that uh, maya uh, plays many sports <laughs> and hockey she plays hockey as well but hockey is one sport that she refuses to learn from me <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know that's a uh, tough part of being a, 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 a former india hockey player and a father as well so uh i i think this that that's a different psychology with with kids but but yeah you know i i'm really happy that she loves sport she 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 loves to play all sport right now and right now uh, it's it's i'm happy that we can give her the opportunity to play many sports she, she plays football hockey uh, uh badminton swimming tennis etc in fact tennis is the sport that she is uh, sort of playing little bit more seriously compared to the others 
and like for me i'm i'm fascinated to see that because i, I never he- uh, held a tennis racket in my life and i never had the opportunity to play tennis uh, we didn't have any club membership or or stuff like that with no access to tennis courts so i'm glad that i could give her the opportunity but as long as she's just having fun uh, 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 <laughs> I'm, i'm i'm just really happy and you spoke about kids as well and i think one of the biggest goals of ogq is to inspire million uh, not just all indians but especially young kids and if we are able to give them hope and inspiration in a large way i think uh, the goal would be achieved so uh to inspiring young kids along with using sport as a tool towards nation building yeah and just making all of us feel proud and like i said our tagline shantanu it takes just 6 grams of gold to lift the worth of a nation 6 grams of gold that's the weight of pure gold in an olympic gold medal and uh, that's what we strive for it's amazing and some of the some of the uh, stories around children taking up sport like we spoke about it earlier as well but the stats are staggering in terms of the for example the badminton courts in hyderabad yeah uh, like i don't uh, 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 it's you should talk about that in those just infrastructure that kind of just follows when children get inspired parents get inspired and then like the city kind of moves in to kind of build something where now there is just yeah, yeah. institutional right right uh, scale so uh um, you know when we started supporting saina and sindhu in in 2009 um gopi said tell me that there were around 30 badminton courts in hyderabad similar number in bangalore um uh, i was talking to narish krishna somi uh uh from from cult Naresh was telling me today in Bangalore anecdotally there are about seven thousand badminton courts, and uh, almost a similar num- uh, in Bangalore, uh, almost a similar number in Hyderabad anecdotally. So you can thousand. So you can imagine uh, the, the uh, what role models like Saina and Sindhu have done to a sport. How many people are playing badminton? How many job opportunities? it ha- it has created to build the scores maintain the scores coaches uh, in in involved uh, uh, people playing much more sport much healthier uh, style of living so i think uh, we can never underestimate the importance of just strong heroes and role models it's going to yeah it'll all add up look uh, since we were born at least you and i were born we didn't 88 no medal 92 no medal 96 bronze yeah and the face yeah 2000 bronze one issue one issue yeah out of the blue one day we hear somebody's won a bronze nobody cares the yeah. next day we move on 2004 silver rajyawardhan rata yeah 2001 gold one gold abhinav bindra yeah and then then 12 was when it's yeah and then kind of yeah yeah you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. happen you yeah, yeah. you kind of and then six in uh 2012 2 in rio, rio that was a blip that was a blip then seven including Neeraj and yep, Gold. Yep. We've gone from 65th in the list, next to uh, you know Egypt, I think at that point in time, to 35th or 36th today. Well, I don't think that's our deserved place as a nation, right? Um, sure, you know we have several other problems to solve in the country, but we've got to be there at least in the top 10. At least Italy, Hungary, I don't know Korea. These are they sound more like the company we need to be in. Yeah, yeah if yeah. not the. U.S., China, and such kind of yeah. Yeah, this is like like the numbers you are talking about. This is now we are smelling the precipice of the S curve, you know. Like, and the unfortunate part is every data point is four years apart. So we don't if it's if it's going to take two extra cycles, it's it's a long it's a decade that you kind of go behind. So how does OGQ kind of pull that S curve as close to the present as possible? Yeah. Is, yes. Yeah. Is uh, probably a big part of what you what keeps you up at night. E- even you you like to sleep, you you propagate healthy sleeping. But I don't think you're kind of. No, I I think Hungary is a great example. Uh, at the Tokyo Olympics, uh, India won seven medals. Our best ever performance, Neera Chopra's gold medal, incredible performance uh, by uh, by us. Hungary. which is a dot on the map hungary won 20 medals 
at the Tokyo Olympics. Were they concentrated in a sport or they were guarded? In about four or five sports. But that's the story for most nations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. For, uh, one of the big lessons that you learn from countries like Hungary or UK, like you mentioned, after the '96 Atlanta Olympics, is to win Olympic medals. You have to focus, 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 and play on your strengths. Mm. If you try to correct your weaknesses, the gestation period to get results is just far too uh, uh, too long. And uh, so, so focus is a critical learning. And, and Hungary has a population of like four million people. That's so smaller than Buda. Yeah, so four million people is like Dada railway station at <laughs> nine a.m. on Monday morning. <laughs> so, uh, 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 so, uh, and if Hungary can do that, so can India. To be in the top 10 in the world, Raul, if you look at the stats from the last five Olympics, you have to win about nine or 10 gold medals. Yeah. I think that's possible because in Tokyo itself, India won seven medals. Ideally, we should have won at least 10 medals. In archery, we didn't get a medal. Shooting, we didn't get a medal. Uh, Mary Com missed out on a medal. Vinesh Fogart missed. Deepak Punya came forth. So, so many medals we missed out. Not everything will go your way at the Olympics, but ideally we should have got around 10. Yeah. Now, assumption all 10 were bronze medals. The distance or the difference between a bronze medal and a gold medal is minuscule. Mm. And I think with the right political will, with sustained funding, if we can put the best team in the world working on this 10-year program, mm. I think it's possible by 2032, which is... Eight yeah. or nine years from now, so uh, the third Olympic cycle. It, it's possible, but we got to ensure that the best team and the right funding and the right political win. And I think it's possible for India to do all three of those things at the moment. Why not? Like, look at how many, how long we've come on several other aspects, yeah. right? I mean, we've become, we've gone from nowhere pre 1990s to being real force in multiple areas. I think all of you all in the entrepreneurial world have shown the way uh, what technology can do and what smart people uh, coming together can do. And so if we have uh, achieved it in the tech and entrepreneurial space, I think we can definitely do it in the sporting world as well. How yeah, this, sorry, go ahead. Well, that's the thing, right? Like I think, and for example, uh, Vishwanathan Anand is one of those one of those people who showed us what being a world meter can actually be. And yeah. I think. A combination of him, Dhanraj Pillay, Sachin in the 90s kind of propelled a generation to to think. I, I think people who started their careers in, the, in, the, in that era have gone on to become global CEOs today. So if you look at Satya Nadella, I'm sure while they were growing up and they're, they're starting their careers in the 90s or early 2000s, this generation of sports people motivated corporate leaders in an amazing way. I think what has happened is now the next generation are born like that. Yeah, yeah. They're, bo they're born to think that they'll be world beaters. Right. And they don't like, like what Kabir said, why do you want to play safe? You yeah. don't have to play safe. You're going to, like, yeah, yeah. your foot is on the neck. It is go for the kill and move on. Right? So that is, that's, it's scary how much just pure mindset, everything, all else equal, just pure mindset of being a world beater can s propel outcomes. So I'm really hoping that your your uh, your 2032 uh, top 10. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's ambitious. 10-year-olds today will probably be participating. Or maybe the 12-year-olds today will probably be participating in that Olympics. Yeah, because uh, if you look at the athletes who want to participate in 2032, today they will be 12, 13, 14 yeah. years old. So we got to ensure that we identify the right athletes, put them under the right coaches, the right ecosystem, and the process will generate results in, in 8 to 10 years from now. And I totally agree with you, Shantanu, on the fact that we have to get that killer instinct as a nation. And that's the biggest learning I learned from Australia, playing against Australia. Obviously, in India, at the time I was playing especially, it gave people great joy when we beat Pakistan. But for me, the greatest joy I got was when we beat Australia. Yeah. Because it was just so ha damn hard uh, to actually beat them. Because they will not give you an inch on the ground. And when they have you down, 
दे विल मेक श्योर दे स्ट्रैंगल द लाइफ आउट ऑफ यू दे विल नेवर गिव यू अ चांस टू ग्रोथ लाइफ नो इवन इफ दे आर अप थ्री नील दे कीप गोइंग एट द वी जस्ट नीड टू लर्न टू बी रूथलेस लाइक देम इफ दे आर थ्री नील दे विल मेक इट सेवन नील एंड दे जस्ट कीप गोइंग फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट सेकेंड टू द लास्ट सेकेंड योर हार्ट रेट विल बी एट टू हंड्रेड बीट्स बिकॉज यू विल बी प्लेइंग in a, a kind of intensity that you have never seen before in your life and that's putting you out of your comfort zone because when you're facing the best opponents in the world they will never allow you to stay in a comfort zone they will try every way to uh, possible to put you in an area of discomfort and actually that's where the biggest progress happens a large enabler of this is capital right and i think ogq is one of the most frugal organizations that ever kind of i've learned so much from you uh, you know in my own founder journey but i remember calculating this at the end of uh, rio not not tokyo but um i think the cumulative money we spent to medals one so i tried to get a ball park cost of cost per medal kind of one and while this is not accurate because there are several other stakeholders spending as well but it was a very 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 reasonable number i think it came to 15 crores mm-hmm. gold medal or something like that so that's under 2 million a medal yeah uh <laughs> and i was reading some of the other stats where uk was uk had published they had mm-hmm. spent and there are economies of scale right when you put a lot of great cyclists in one place you're not replicating infrastructure yeah. despite those eco- economies of scale they were at about 5 <laughs> a million a medal a medal a medal wow right uh so we we've done it fairly efficiently like you know all other great indian <laughs> stories like isro is the most celebrated but we do this at yeah, yeah. we do world class products yeah, at world leading cost structures right yeah, yeah. um but capital is still important and uh, csr is a large source for us what do you think will take to get a step change there last we looked at it together the csr market was about 25000 crores or so 120 20- 250 crore i think came to 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 sports yeah. and then we got about 10 of, yeah. of that or so maybe now this year yeah. we've done really well so about 2% of that yeah and i know there's a lot of other problems to solve for rural you know sanitation girl child education and so on but um have you seen this change that organizations are more keen to now spend money on sports because this is also an avenue to effect change yeah. in communities that are otherwise underserved absolutely so uh, you're right travel on the stats because uh, if you look at csr budgets maybe le- less than 1% of total uh, csr budgets are being spent on sport uh, and on one side uh, csr has been a big game changer because uh, ngos like ours that support olympic paralympic or say rural sport are eligible to get csr funds uh, and that has multiplied the funding available to an organization like us we are a not for, for profit organization we can raise funds through donations these donations come from individuals or family foundations or csr uh and csr has really helped us scale our fundraising in a big way today 70% of our uh, funding comes from csr and the good thing about csr funding is that it's fairly sticky funding once you get it they stay for the long uh, run the challenge that we face is that in india there are so many rational causes uh, primarily being health and education of course but over and above that is covid and sanitation and women's welfare and a hundred other things so when you go to any big corporate there are generally 50 proposals on the table and all of them are uh, one more important than the uh, other so the the challenge here is do i spend 20 50 lakhs to uh, to send 50 girls to school or construct 50 toilets in in a village or to get a foreign coach for ravi kumar or for uh, uh, or for lakshya sen and and what i say is you give us 1% of your csr budget and you look at the credibility of the organization you look at accountability you look at transparency you look at the communication you look at the inspiration value you look at performance track record that most at track now at an impact in society and if you like it you you give more so i think 
there is a space today in India for everyone to coexist and there's enough and more funding. I truly believe that I think if you have the right people, if you have the right organization showing the, showcasing the right impact, if you have credibility, there is no dirt of funding. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we got to reach out to the right people who see sport as an important tool in nation building and bringing pride to the nation, giving hope to millions of young kids. Nation building, upliftment of society, happiness of child, it, it has yeah. a lot of spillover effect in terms of... And, and health, like Shantanu, you said, we, uh, we spoke about the badminton courts. Yeah. 700 badminton courts, they're coming into existence because people uh, believe that there is a market for that. People want to play badminton. Yeah. If you look at the Gopichand Academy or the Prakash Padukone Badminton Academy, there are about 16 badminton courts in these places. From 6 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at the night, the courts are absolutely packed. You will not get a court free because people are playing throughout the day. And some hours are allocated obviously for the top players, but the rest of the hours are pay and play. That means people are paying and coming to play badminton. And if you look at the health profile, if people are more and more people are playing, sure. that can only be good for our nation. I think that journey to the tricolor going up and national anthem playing, mm. which by the way induces goosebumps every single time for me. I don't know how many times I, I would rewatch Neeraj's yeah, you know, yeah, ceremony. Yeah, yeah. It just happens to me every time. Knowing yeah. what's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I still feel the same emotion. Yeah. I think the journey to that destination um, has many leading indicators along the way, but none better than you having pamped badminton courts, football fields, tennis courts with kids. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I think we are then unstoppable yeah. because then the process being put into motion already. Yeah. Combine that with the great ingredients like you know you're doing with sports science coaches and everything else. I'm really hopeful that yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. 32 dream is fulfilled. Yeah. And, and there's so many tech entrepreneurs like uh, Girish Matrabhutam yeah. who has just invested in a state-of-the-art football academy in uh, in Mahabalipuram. Yeah. I, Hashtag Messi from Madras. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it's incredible that more and more people are investing in sport and believing in, in the power of sport. And one of the reasons he actually built it because he wanted to take his son for football training in, in Madras and he didn't find any good facility or he didn't find any good coaches. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see the, uh, more and more involvement. In. Amazing. I, I, like, I was just thinking, we just got out of the Tokyo Olympic cycle and now it's is now one, next year. One, one and a half year it's, away. Four so. years seems like a long time, but if you just kind of... I also, I think this, we lost a year because of yeah, COVID. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think... Uh, time flies. Time, time does fly. No, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, uh, from a time standpoint, we are... I think we can have at least two more episodes uh, with, <laughs> with, with Viren and, and with Neha and, and then, you know, the, the, the larger team at OGQ as well. But I wanted to like just... Express my deepest gratitude to both of you, actually, to you for introducing me to the world of OGQ, and for you, to you for allowing me to be a part of uh, a part of it. Because every single interaction, uh, whether it is with you or an athlete or Neha or anyone or Webhav, uh, who's now become an entrepreneur, um, uh, has been deeply humbling. Because you guys have a have a DNA of just such high achievement and such. Uh, so rooted to the ground, which is there across, I think it's a, it's a, it's a thing about sport in India, and I I walk away humbled every time, and I think it's a it's a dose which uh, which which is very healthy for me uh, of inspiration, humility, and just living life the right way. Uh, so I'm so glad you came here and shared stories within uh, your experiences, and were so authentic as you always are, uh, but. Um, uh, I'm hoping that people who view, uh, you know watch this is an entrepreneurship podcast, right? But I think today became something much bigger than that, which is around around what it takes to achieve excellence. And you embody that, and you through your organization, you also create it in others. So big, big thank you, and you know, kind of rooting for that seven number to hit twenty, uh, maybe twenty twenty eight, but not twenty twenty thirty two. But thank you so much for coming, and I don't know Raul whether you also final. Final words. You said it all. Thank you for allowing me to be part of OGQ over the last uh, decade, decade and a half. I think it's one of the 
most gratifying things ever in life. I think it's a lifelong dream shared with you that uh, we see the national anthem playing and we see India in its in its deserved place um, in the sporting stage as well, just like the nation has done on several other stages. No, well, thanks, uh, guys. It's been incredible to be over here. I'm a massive fan of the barber shop and uh, so many people I know and admire have been on the show. So um, just immensely honored and privileged uh, to be over here. Uh, Shantanu and uh, both of you guys are two guys who I just admire immensely and learned uh, so much and uh, yeah, the feeling is just mutual so thank you for all the uh, support to GQ uh, over the years uh, from both of you I just think that we need to get uh, 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 from a selfish point of view more and more good people involved in Oh for sure, I think that's one thing that um, uh, people who are watching uh, would, I would love to take away is uh, if you are interested in sports, if you are if you want to be a part of the revolution that is creating sporting excellence and aiming for glory through Olympic goals, uh, I think uh, being a part of OGQ in whatever way you can uh, will be amazing. I think uh, we will put, uh, I don't know how they will reach out to you, but I think we'll find a way to uh, for people to write in, especially people who want to be a part of it, either through effort, capital, in or in any other way. Absolutely. Thank you, Virat. Thank Th you so much. Thank you, Shantanu. Thanks, Raul. Thanks, well, Ed. Thanks, 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 buddy. Hey, thanks, thanks. Very good. Feedback, guys? Oh, yes, Viren. Buddy, thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have buddy, these for you. Are they? Too good, yeah. Too good. <laughs> Raul, you also come here. Yeah. No, please, please. I've had time. Come, come, come. 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 Come